I don't really know how to start this. It's my first one. At the time of writing this, I'm living in western Pennsylvania, a little south of Pittsburgh. I was in Boy Scouts for most of my life, so I feel very comfortable in the woods, and I often go camping. Upon hearing Governor Wolf's school closure plan, I decided that it was time for some cold weather camping. It was March. It wasn't that cold, but it did drop to 40 degrees at night, and the people who I went were not really avid campers. If you're from Pittsburgh, you may know the Boggs campsite on the Montour Trail. Well, that's where we went. They, of course, only brought weed and alcohol, did not bring any sleeping bags, blankets, or pillows. So, naturally, I assumed they were going to have sit by a fire all night. It was light when we first got there, and the fire pit was still smoldering. Very cool. We used the coals from the previous camper's fire to light ours. Immediately, I knew that I would have to provide wood for the fire until I went to bed. They passed out beers at around 3 p.m. The times are going to be a bit dodgy. I was not near my phone. After having two to three, I just honestly wanted dinner. Now, that they did for me. They made ramen noodles and cheese, which was amazing, and burgers over the fire. By this time, it would have been close to 5 p.m. It began to rain just a little bit, as was forecasted. So we took shelter in the lean-to shelter that was on site, and occasionally, one of them would throw some sticks on the fire. The sticks were all they seemed to be able to find, even though I brought two saws and an axe. I would cut up some logs. By the time the rain stopped, all four of us smoked and were sitting around the fire. I was light out, so we'll call it seven. After a while of just hanging around, they asked if I had any blankets. I always have blankets. Nothing special, but we've had some pretty bad snowstorms in the past, and a couple of scratchy car blankets are always useful. They each got a blanket, except for R, as we'll call him, who got my summer sleeping bag that I brought just in case. By now, it was dark, around 9 or 9.30 p.m., and the fire was getting low. I start off to find some more wood, because they wanted to smoke more. Now, it's important to know that I'm 6'5", and a semi-frequent user of weed so my tolerance is pretty high. I return with the wood, and we spark up another one, a smaller one, just kind of hang out, talk, listen to music. Good times. Eventually the fire again dies down a little bit, and again, it's my job to get more wood. Because we had been there for a while, and there were people there before us, most of the wood near the shelter was either really small or all used up, so I had to keep going farther and farther away from camp to find wood. About 12.30 a.m., close to 50 degrees, so we're all doing well. I got a flashlight, a really nice one that I used for scuba diving. That is also kind of bright, so I use it on the low setting on land. At this point, I'm far enough away from camp that my friends cannot really see me, and there's like an embankment between the Montour Trail and someone's driveway that you have to cross to get to more woods. But I'm comfortable alone because I knew what I was doing, and they could hear if I needed them. I start to hear a weird whistling sound, kind of like somebody inhaling through a snorkel, but I believe it's just the wind. The air was starting to get kind of cold, so I took back what I had and put some on the fire. Now it's 1 to 2 in the morning, around 40 degrees with some light breeze. Nothing severe. I have two long sleeve shirts and an army surplus coat that is super warm, but my friends are in windbreakers and hoodies, and oh yeah, now it's raining. Off to get more wood. This time... I began taking into consideration that the type of wood that I would collect, 
there was a lot of pine, but that burns fast, which is why I had to go and collect it so often. The stretch of woods near the driveway was pretty much all pine. A few maples, but nothing big. I keep walking, knowing that this area has both conifers and deciduous trees in close proximity to each other. As I'm wondering, collecting wood, I notice that the rain has turned to a super fine snow. Time to head back, just in case it picks up. Then the whistling started again, a lot louder now. It's weird. There isn't any more wind than there was before. Maybe it changed directions. I keep walking. By now, I can hear the music from camp and pick up the pace just a little bit. Just as I summit the embankment and prepare to clamber down the other side, a loud noise echoes behind me. A tree fell. Shining my flashlight around, I could not see a single sign that that was the case and did not see a source. Maybe a deer knocked something over. In my head it does not matter, because I'm back at camp anyway, and I can try the marsh behind our shelter next time. At three in the morning? They were cold. The temperature now dropped to around 30 degrees, and the wind and snow had really picked up. Car blankets helped the boys a little bit, but they were not going to be able to sleep in a tent that I brought. Not without freezing. Except for R, who slept like a rock all night, after about 3.30. We decided to finish off our smoke and beer, and a good talking. 4.30 a.m. I'm about ready for bed at this point. I'm not too inebriated at all, but I was definitely pretty tired. I offer to go collect more wood before I retire to my zero-degree sleeping bag and cot. I camp comfy when I don't have to carry it far. They said they would join me. They must have been cold. We split up, and I end up heading back to where I was before. Except this time I left my flashlight on high, and I made a bunch of noise to scare off that deer, or whatever that was there earlier. I ended up a little further away from camp than I had intended, because there were only pine branches on the ground. The whistling starts again. And this time, I could tell the direction it was coming from. My left. And I shine my flashlight around that area before just returning to collecting wood. And then the sound stops briefly. Picks up again in a different direction, less than a minute later. This time in front of me, and a little to the right, back into the pines. Maybe the branches of certain trees catch the wind just right and make that noise. So, I think whatever and move on. Then, on my way back, the noise was following me, darting from left to right, but always sounding like right behind me. I didn't see anything, so whatever. Then the noise makes like one sharp whistle and pauses. Then I hear, it's cold out here. It was R, but I couldn't find him with my flashlight, so I called, Where you at? And it sounded like he turned around, because I heard a branch snap and a bit of movement. I pointed my flashlight at where the sound was coming from, and I did not see R anywhere. Maybe he's behind a bush or a tree or something. I call out again. No reply. He might be lost or something because we weren't at camp, and he saw my flashlight moving, so he came to look. I asked again, where are you? Nothing. And then louder. I'm gonna go back to camp. I thought he was trying to scare me. Shining my flashlight around one last time, I spot something dive into a bush, about 40 feet from where I heard R turn around. I see you, big man. Grab some wood and come back. He's around six foot tall, about 250 pounds. I shine the light around for a few more seconds, then turn around again and start walking. The whistling is back. No matter what speed I moved at, it always seemed the same distance away. I decide that I just kind of sit under a tree and wait for R to pass by because 
he had to come back sometime. I saved battery of my flashlight, so I turned it off, closed one eye, so it would adjust faster. By now, the snow had picked up a really good bit, which is another good reason to stop, just in case R got lost. I couldn't really see far because there was a lot of cloud cover, despite being a full moon. The whistling never got closer, but it did start to move around a little bit, in a really odd circle. It would start in one spot, stop, then promptly start in another spot that was in a different direction. I realized that it had to be the wind or something, because it was moving way too fast, and moving at random. Cool. Now, where is R? I turn on my flashlight between whistles, and call out to his name again. It's important to note here that the whistling never picked up while I looked around. It normally only stopped for a second or two, and it was super quiet. The snow was laying on the ground, and we had two to three in on the ground by now, so maybe that muffled it. Anyway, upon not hearing R, I thought that maybe I missed him, or did not hear him at all, starting to head back to camp. As I stood up and brushed the dirt off my butt, I shined the flashlight around one more time, and I was thinking in my head. I definitely heard him. After I stood up with the wood in my arms and began to walk back towards camp, I saw something move out of the corner of my eye. My flashlight, being a diving light, has a wrist mount that I was wearing, so I could use it and carry things. I turned towards and scanned the area with my flashlight. Nothing. Not even four steps more, and I saw another movement. Now the whistling was back. It's annoying. It sounds like a fat guy who just ran up the stairs. Flashlight was on low, so I can only see maybe 40 feet around me. I didn't see anything, but I knew it was time to pick up the pace. The whistling was followed by flashes of movement, and I know it's not the wind. At this point, I'm speed walking. Being tall, I can move if I have to and I was definitely traveling at jogging speed. R, a lumbering beast when he runs, could not move this fast or quietly through the woods. Another thing that it's not. I decided then to turn off the flashlight, move into some brush that was close by. Not sure why, but I was getting a little weirded out. Had the shakes, even though I was warm. It was silent again. Well... Whatever this is, is it hunting me? Is it a coyote? Not a coyote. There was a good period of silence, then more whistling. This time, it wasn't circling around me, just moving around where I had turned off the flashlight. My eyes adjusted, and I peeked out from under the bush that I was rolled up under. Nothing. Just that whistling again. By this point, I was pretty much sober, like if I got pulled over, I can nail the field sobriety test. I waited for a little while the thing just kind of looked around. Then I heard it speak. In a really gargled impression of me, it called out, Big man. It took everything I had not to panic. It's not R. It's not a human. Not a deer. Not the wind. Then it spoke again, saying R's name. Cutting off really strangely like you just lifted the needle off a record, but picking back up with Back to Camp. Still in a mimic version of my voice. My voice. I normally don't like hearing recordings of myself anyway, but now I really don't like them. It said a few more things in different voices that I did not recognize. All the voices were either talking about how cold it was, or questions like, what was that? Stop messing with me. But they all seemed like whoever was talking had some phlegm built up in their throat. Then it went quiet. I poked my head out of the bushes again, saw something sitting against a tree in the same position I had been in. Left leg straight out, right leg at an angle, hands behind my head. It could have fooled me as being R, 
We both kind of sit the same way, except his ADHD usually makes him fidget with his hands. Okay, so who's sitting in the woods with me? I lay there, silent. Just watch. It begins to whistle. So that's where it's coming from. It moves its hand around in a fist, out in front of it. The same way that I look around with my flashlight. Then begins to stand up. And it's tall. I only weigh 166. Skin and bone mostly. So when I say that this thing was skinny, don't take it lightly. I could see how thin its long spindly arms were silhouetted against the snow that coated a bush behind it. When it stood up, it was hunched over. Not sure if I was slouching when I stood up, but I certainly do slouch. It walked a few paces away from the tree and stood up the entire way. I worked with backdrops for theater productions, and the walls we use for most are around eight feet high, and this thing would have easily been able to see over one. I'm talking by at least by a foot. It slowly peers around, no hair on its head, and its side profile showed a super disfigured skull, the jaw hanging pretty far down, and there weren't really any lips that stuck out. But it was kind of hard to tell because of how dark it was. It let out one final R, big man, kind of like somebody with Tourette's would say, because they were just random and strung together. Then it let out this awful scream. My dad used to take me to air shows a lot as a kid, and this has been the same pitch and volume as an F-16. I couldn't move. It then peered down, around, head just seemingly sweeping the area. Then it crouches down again, leaps for a tree with the lowest branch, and being around 15 feet, lands feet first on one of the branches, sits there, squatting, whistling, staring around, then disappears, faster than should be allowed in nature. I quickly count to ten in my head. The forest sleeps. I slowly make my way out from under the bush, begin to creep back towards camp, this time avoiding using my flashlight or making any noise if possible. I climb the embankment and take one last look towards the woods. Unsure if that just happened, or if I was asleep. I tumble down the other side of the embankment and return to relative safety of the big fire with Y and J and the other two who went for wood. They had asked me where's my wood. Oh, it had a... it had bugs. It's fine. We got a lot anyway. They stacked up a solid pile of oak and pine. Not enough for the night, but enough for a little while. I asked where R was, and they pointed at the tent. He was passed out in there, snoring. I climbed into my sleeping bag, began to warm up a little bit. I was covered in snow, and then I heard that thing scream again off in the distance. Please don't tell me it's coming here. The other two looked at me wide-eyed. Normally, if I recognize a sound, I say what it is out loud, so they know what's up. To this, I had no response. They asked if I had heard the first one. Good. They heard it too. I answered with a nod as I unlocked the car in case we needed to book it. They asked if I saw it. I nodded. What was it? No clue. I described it to them quietly so that I could listen for more noises and told them about it imitating my voice. Y was now pretty freaked out and Jay thought I was BSing him said it was some kind of owl. I got out of my sleeping bag, threw my coat back on, and joined them at the fire. For the first time in a while, I looked at my phone. It was now almost six in the morning. We looked up native owl calls and came up empty-handed. The same happened with every other animal we tried. Jay did seem a little nervous. I suggested that maybe it's a truck on the highway. He agreed that that's probably what it was. They didn't sleep. I forced sleep upon myself so that we wouldn't die on the car ride home. The next morning we went for a walk. It did not snow much after I got back, 
so you can kind of follow my footprints. The tree, the thing leapt into, was out of reach of me on Jay's shoulders. R was still asleep, but I think I might have been able to reach it if I was on his. The tree I sat under had scratch marks on it. I think they're from deer shedding the velvet off their antlers, but it creeped me out nonetheless. The tree it sat under had footprints everywhere. There seemed to be no order to them. It was amazing. It looked like it had run over every square inch of that area, coming as close to the bush as I was in two meter lengths. I don't really know much about cryptids or anything, but when I got home, I googled North American Tall Skinny Cryptid, and the second result was from Parade. A list of cryptids, after ruling out everything else in the list, I came across a picture of the Wendigo that has antlers. Not quite, but pretty close as described. Tall and skinny and super fast. I did research. Every picture has antlers, but I can't find any evidence that, other than a few movies, it had antlers. I don't know. What I saw definitely didn't have antlers, but it matched everything else. Even down to the whistling. This was kind of long, but I'd appreciate any feedback. Thanks. So, I grew up being exposed to Bigfoot. Although it took years until I realized what I was actually dealing with. My family is very aware that they live on my father's property. My sister, who also lives in the country, thought she too had a Bigfoot because they would always hear children giggling outside. But there's nobody there. When I visit her home, I live in Canada. She lives in Ohio. I always feel uncomfortable, and I'm able to sense that there is indeed something there. I've never really mentioned it because I didn't want to scare her, my nephew. I knew something was looking in the windows at me at night, but I thought it was their Bigfoot, despite it feeling different. Well, now I'm convinced we are not dealing with Bigfoot. Recently, my sister has been hearing things outside, like clicking, stuff to get her attention when she is smoking on the steps to her house. She thought a coyote had approached her in the night, but she said something wasn't right about it. All she could see were the eyes. She only hoped it was a coyote. Two days ago, she said that something was whistling at her, and she was scared. Then, last night, she called me, panicked, saying she had heard kittens meowing in distress. She is a cat lover, after all. And to me, it's trying to lure my sister out, and it knows she loves cats. She said that none of her animals would go outside with her last night. Her dog is attached to her hip, so the fact that he did not want to go out there was a red flag. At first, I thought it was a Wendigo, so I began doing research. Obviously, my understanding of what those were was wrong. So, now I'm here, looking for advice on how to get rid of whatever this is. Be it a skinwalker, or a flesh gate. I knew there was something wrong with that land. And to give a little backstory, in my teens, I live in a small town in Oregon, and on property, surrounded by a forest that's really not that dense. I have a few neighbors that are not close, but still within yelling distance. Last night, I was told to go close the gate. It's about 150 feet away from my house. I don't like going outside at night. And people at our house, not just my family, have occasionally heard someone calling to them, trying to lure them into the dark areas of our property and out of view of our four cameras. They only cover the area around the entrances, which I have had happen to me once. I asked my mom if I can ask my dad to go with me to shut the gate. She said yes, then she got mad at my dad for agreeing, even though she said I could ask him. 
she called me immature, ended up running really fast to close the gate. On to the actual story. I decided to talk to my friend about how my mom got mad about my dad, willing to go out with me to shut the gate. The conversation drifted to why I don't like to go outside and tell him about the four encounters, including mine, about something mimicking somebody's voice, luring them into the darkness. He does not believe in things like that, and I go to sleep, wake up like normal, and I get to talking about what I was telling my friends to my older sister, and how we needed more cameras, since they aren't capturing this thing. Can you guess what she tells me? Last night, while my mother was smoking, she heard my older sister calling to her from the darkest part of our property, and the biggest blind spot of our four cameras, all trying to lure her away into the darkness. Also, this has happened to my older sister, twice, along with hearing heavy footsteps on the roof at nighttime. She doesn't like going out at night anymore, not any more than I do. Now, she knows why I don't like going outside at night. I'm not just being immature. I think it might be a skinwalker but someone with more knowledge please shed some light about what kind of creature this could be. My dad has night vision binoculars that can take pictures and record video, but sadly, no audio. I'm hoping these will come in handy. I'm going to ask my parents if they're willing to add at least one more camera in the blind spot, since that small area is where three out of the five events happened. As I noticed... It likes to stay away from our night vision cameras. I also asked my mother about it. She said that it happens a lot. She goes out in the middle of the night to smoke, and that huge light illuminates most of it sometimes when she goes out. This is not normal. It shouldn't do that. The bulb was well over 15 years old when we replaced it a couple of months ago. Can skinwalkers shut off lights? I never knew that it happened at all, since I have never seen it, though I check the cameras frequently. This all happened at the very beginning of this year, in January 2021. I inherited my grandfather's acreage, which is roughly 300 plus. He used it for hunting, agriculture, and other things that I'm probably not even aware of. I'm always curious about the wildlife that lives back there, since it's mostly denser woods. Even in the winter, when all the foliage dies, and it's pretty cleared out with all empty trees, it still is a little bit more dense. So, I went back there with about six game cams, stuck it on several different trees, just to see what I could find besides deer. It was more just a fun experiment than anything. But as I was setting them up, I experienced something bone-chilling. This awful feeling had come over me. I can't even begin to describe to you how terrible it was. It was this sense of dread, pure fear and terror, like I just needed to drop what I was doing and run. Run for my life. Run for my safety. My sanity. It was so strange how the feeling would just come over me so suddenly. And then... Before I could even act or not act on it, I began hearing whispers or chanting all around me. It appeared to be or sounded like it was omnidirectional, below me, above me, all around me, and would circulate. I had a hard time deciphering how close or how far it was, but it was like a group of people or one person. It sounded like it would alternate, of like somebody whispering or whispering a chant. It was very eerie, and very scary. I'm sorry I don't have any more details, but that was enough. I ran back to the house, and stayed there. After a few days, I kind of forgot about it, and at this point, it was probably a Saturday. I was off work, and decided it would be best to utilize the daylight of the early day, and go and fetch the few game cams I did manage to get up just to make sure that they were working, since there were a lot of wildlife back there, even in the wintertime. As I went to go get the cameras, 
All three that I had placed up were gone. Not a single one could be found. The last time it had snowed was the morning that I set up the game cams. So my tracks were there, but nobody else's. And the cameras were just gone. There was no sign of anybody even coming up to them and taking them off. On top of that, this property is pretty secluded out in the middle of nowhere. I don't even know the nearest neighbor, and nobody else hunts back here since it is private property. And during this time of year, hunting isn't even active anyway, so there's absolutely zero reason why anybody should even be out here, let alone touching another person's game cams. After looking further, I gave up after finding no trail or sign that where these game cams could have gone. I still don't know, but I almost wonder if that horrifying supernatural chanting and whispering has something to do with it. I live down in central Texas. It all began with a friend of mine, whom we'll call Luke, needing a ride back to a town from Houston. He's like family, so I went and brought him on back. He stays kind of near the Dripping Springs area. Before, he was in Houston. He and I always heard some strange sounds at night on his property, but we always shrugged it off. He's got livestock, so we often protect them from coyotes and other things. Plus, we normally shoot guns out there and don't really worry about what's lurking out there. The night I brought him back, we pulled into his long driveway to head to the house along the driveway. He has a fire pit roughly 40 feet away from said road. I know these creatures are tall, but hear me out. Down by the pit from the car, we both noticed two blue-bordered, massive yellow eyes in my headlight beams, staring straight at us. So I said, Luke, what is that? Do you see that? As I reached for my flashlight and one of my firearms, I ended up grabbing my 22 with hollow points. I jumped out of my car to run straight to the gleaming eyes. They seemed to blink once and then vanished into the dark. I ran to where I saw it standing, looked all around, the whole FBI flashlight handgun stance, scanning. I hear footsteps approaching from behind. Startling at first, but these steps were from Luke coming up behind me, yelling, Watch out. I turn around to him, just a few feet away. He'd stopped. He looked confused, looks around, and then said, It was just behind you, and it was waist high. I think to myself, What's waist high, and has night vision? Mountain lions. So that's what I thought for a moment, still standing in that spot. He says, we need more gear. So we went to my car. We loaded up, killed the engine, then back into the trees. We approached the tree line, aiming the lights into the trees, about waist high. Then I beam my light upwards and see those same eyes dart in a straight line to our left, further into the trees, away from my car, away from his house. Now we're spooked. How is it nine to ten feet up in the air, or trees, without making a single noise? No wing flap, no twigs, footsteps, just dead silence. It's about 2.30 a.m. now. We'd been following and going the direction we saw the eyes trail towards, staying very quiet. Suddenly, I promise and swear my life to this day, out of the thicket, about eight feet in front of me, I see the eyes open within the darkness of the woods, massive and glowing, and a few inches apart, which made me assume that this creature has size on its side. It stared into me. I stared back. I'm facing this unknown creature at this moment, and I shakily ask, Luke, are you seeing this? Not moving my flashlight and not breaking eye contact. 
I want to know where this thing is, and I want to know if it moves. I don't, dude. What do you see? So I asked him again, if he's sure he's not seeing this. He says he doesn't again. I assume the only reason he did not see these eyes is because my flashlight and my angle with the beam. He was not standing directly in front of the creature, as he was about six feet to my right at that moment. So I understand why he couldn't see what I saw, due to angle and perspective. After that little back and forth, I see it approach me. It got closer. I raised my handgun. I said out loud, I'm firing. Then I fired at this unknown being, directly between the eyes. The round I'd fired stirred up a lot. We heard a very short but low-pitched growl or grunt, followed by what sounded like something very heavy, easily heavier than myself, knocking into a couple of trees around it. Above, the birds in that tree dispersed. We heard no footsteps, no retreating, and stayed there a few moments longer, listening, scanning. We stayed out there, waiting to hear or see anything else for about an hour after that. But the night remained quiet and calm afterwards. We go inside, call it a weird day, and then go to bed. The next morning, we went to where we spotted and fired. Then we found a bunch of triangle-shaped footprints that led to the fence. We look up. There's a break in the top fencing wires. Right on the other side of the break, a few limbs and branches had been freshly broken off as they lay there on the ground. Some remained dangling and facing the forest floor, like where you would land if you were to jump from the wire break at the top. This is all I have on this story, other than the fact that my friend and I to this day still occasionally see those eyes at night, in our dreams, and even in our windows. The summer between junior year of high school and senior year, I had a lot of firsts, including my own account with what I believed to be a skinwalker. After talking to my grandmother, who's half-blooded Navajo, she believes that we've had something following our family ever since we left the res. I never had any experiences myself, not until that summer, where this thing would start appearing almost everywhere I go. It first happened when I was walking back from the store one evening, visiting a friend's house. I had gotten some candy and a pop, and was walking home, just minding my own business, listening, jamming out to Spotify, when I saw this strange tall coyote figure off in the distance on the hillside. I didn't really think much of it, and kind of just shrugged it off as maybe I'm seeing things in the evening light. But I looked again, and this figure which appeared to look like a tall coyote, walking on two legs, coming toward me, but at a diagonal angle. This only caused me to walk faster. Now, I was a little freaked out, and I did not know exactly if this was a person in a costume or what I was going to be dealing with. As I picked up my pace, whatever this person or thing was, also picked up their pace. And before you know it, this thing was within 30 feet of me, so I stopped, looked directly at it, in hopes to make it stop. I know that sounds incredibly cheesy, but at 17 years of age, I had no idea what else to do. I knew running would probably only make it chase me even more. And it stopped, looked at me, and it was right at that point that I could see into its eyes. They were very dark, but the irises and the pupil were almost like a glowing ambery orange, very evil looking. The face looked very sunken down, very dark, and not in a color dark way, like there was something wrong with it. And for whatever reason, I believe that what I was looking at was completely from the demonic realm. It was kind of like half man, half coyote, except the head was entirely coyote, but the body and the legs were more man-like than anything else. I kind of just quickly looked down, paused my Spotify, and slowly backed away as this thing stood still 
and never took its eyes off me. I backpedaled and backpedaled until I could turn around and think to myself, I'm going to make a run for it and take a chance. If this thing follows me, I'm hoping I can outrun it. So I backpedaled some more, with this thing still staring me down, eyes on me like a dagger, and in one fluid motion, I turned around and sprinted faster than a high school track runner, all the way down the block, down a second block, down the next block, never looking back, and never hearing this thing following me. Once I'd made it several blocks, right to where near the store where I bought my candy and pop, I looked back, didn't see anything, didn't hear anything. I felt like I was safe, for the time being. So I walked home the long way, which took an extra 40 minutes from where I was at. Once I got home, I felt really uneasy the rest of the night. Like my entire night was just ruined. I was in a foul mood. Not just obvious distress, but something had disrupted me, emotionally, internally. I feel it was this point that I felt like I was marked. A couple of days go by, and I just get the feeling that maybe it's a good idea that I speak to my grandmother and tell her about what I had encountered a few days before. I knew how she was. She's what I would call very superstitious, even though she still believes in a lot of the native lore, and her beliefs very much so come from that area. I was still very worried that I would be met with conflict and a lot of doubt, but surprisingly, I just said, you know what, screw it. So I called her up, told her what had happened, and she asked that I come over immediately so she could bless me. While she wasn't anything special, like a medicine lady, she was good friends with one of the local medicine men from the res, who actually traveled over 300 miles to come to us to bless me. Well, I think that's great. We still had sightings and encounters the rest of that summer. One time, about a month later, I was spending time with my grandmother's house. At night time, we were outside, smoking cigarettes, joking around. This is in Southern California, far away from the reservation. I didn't think I had anything to worry about, but that was very wrong. And at the time, I didn't think anything of the lore or any of the beliefs of the Navajo. In fact, one of my good friends was actually a mix of Choctaw and Cherokee, and he thinks the entire thing is all baloney. Doesn't believe any of it. He's pretty much rooted in modern day culture though, so the only roots to his native culture are his blood. I pretty much sided with him before all of this happened, but once I started having my encounters, I kind of switched to the other direction as far as my beliefs go. Having first-hand accounts with something will definitely change the way you think and feel about anything in particular. So, anyway, we're out there, smoking cigarettes, joking around, and the sun's pretty much setting really low in the sky. We kind of just get lost in telling each other stories and talking about fun memories we have together. And before you know it, it's pretty much almost pitch dark out. My grandmother's inside, and she's probably wanting to know when my friend is going to leave so she can spend time with me. At one point or another, him or I were mid-sentence when we both felt this distinct change in the air and atmosphere around us. It was so noticeable that as soon as it happened, I felt the change on both of our faces, like our expressions had changed from normal to now, what's going on? We both instantly began looking around us, expecting somebody to be near but it was so dark now that we couldn't see anything and we did not have any flashlights, only our phones and the flashlight app on our phone isn't all that bright. I mean, you could only see maybe five or seven feet in front of you. Whatever we felt wasn't good. We quickly wrapped up our conversation, threw our cigarettes down and walked back into the house. Very quickly, he's like, hey man, I think I'm going to take off. And so, I didn't argue with him. I just wished him well on his way. So he heads out, and I start talking to my grandma. And maybe 30 seconds goes by, and I immediately remember. I needed to borrow 20 bucks from him. So I run outside, and remember, 
It's pretty dark out now. And I call to him, and I hear him call back to me. So I run up to him, and I'm like, hey man, I forgot to ask you, from earlier, could I borrow that $20? And instantly, I feel this force come at both of us. It made us both jump, and we both take off running. The only way I know how to explain it is that it felt like something very evil coming right for us, and our bodies just reacted to the emotion and took off running in the same direction. We both ran and ran until we got to a couple streets down, where him and I are panting, not knowing exactly what was pursuing us. I knew right then and there, it's exactly what I saw a month ago, the same creature. So I tell him, forget trying to run away. Let's run in a big loop around the neighborhood and circle our way back to my grandmother's house, because I'm sure at this point, she's probably wondering why I have not come back inside. So we do that, and it takes us about 12 minutes, being very stealthy, very careful, but we could still feel a change, a very distinctive change in the atmosphere. It's incredibly creepy. We make our way back to the house, praying that this thing did not follow us. We get inside, and my grandmother immediately notices both our faces are pale white, and we look scared out of our minds. She knows, and immediately calls her friend, the medicine man, and says that she knows what happened. We need to be blessed immediately. Yeah, that summer was a wild one. And since then, I try not to mess around too much with things I don't know too much about. There were other small incidents here and there, but those were the main two that were actually worth writing about. And the fact that the second time, I feel like whatever this thing was, assuming it is a skinwalker, wanted to attack me, potentially kill me. Why it had targeted me and my family, I'm not too sure. I also don't know too much about my family's history on my mother's side, which is my grandmother, who's half Navajo, and her side, which, if you keep going up the family tree, is all full-blooded Navajo. Maybe the family on her side did something, and this thing has been tracking us down ever since. This is all just guessing, of course, because I really don't know, and I have not asked my grandmother. But, you know, even as I write this, maybe it's time I do. My grandfather was not a good man around this time of his story. He was really what you would call a disappointment. My mother even tells me, back when he was in his prime, he was hanging out at the Rez's skate park with some friends, and just overall, having the time of his life. They were drinking, and trying no things, just teens being teens. It's said that they saw a figure walking in the woods. They began to harass and yell, thinking it was a person. It gets fuzzy here, but he said that it began to chase them, maybe 500 feet where they ended up behind the school in a little shed, closed the door and hid. I guess it saw them and ended up knocking around the shed and wouldn't leave. He and his friends hid from whatever it was till morning. And prior to when I was born, my mom was in a similar mental situation as my grandfather. This one is shorter. The story goes, my mother and aunt were hanging out in an empty house, drinking, and doing other things that teens do. Chilling. And then they hear a very loud cackle, like laugh. They stopped everything, and waited to see if somebody would come out. My aunt, being who she is, laughed, and once again, it started up. My mother had freaked out, and begged her to stop. Just then, a beer bottle flew past my aunt's head, busted in the back wall. I don't recall what she did after, but I'm assuming they ran. When my uncle was around two or three, he had gone missing for a few hours, and they ended up finding him where the res meets the forest. They asked him what happened, and he just said, I was playing with the little people. The little people are a legend of a lot of tribes, but have represented differently. My people portray them as tricksters, who also sometimes mean bad luck, or even death. Again, these stories are passed down to me 
by my elders and mom. My writing isn't the best. I still ain't got the point of posting. However, I hope you were able to understand at least some of this. Thank you. So, as a preface to the story, I was driving on the State Road 54, a road in Florida that goes all throughout the state, and for the most part, it used to be all woods. It was 3.45 a.m., and I was driving to my friend's house, who lives just 45 minutes away, to carpool to our job in a city about an hour and a half away from where he lived. I was leaving the city that I lived in and was driving through more heavily wooded areas at a red light. As I was waiting for the light to turn green, I saw the glow of two bright orange eyes. The woods were approximately 25 feet from the main road. The eyes got closer, like it hadn't seen me, and it looked around six to seven feet tall. Thin. Quite thin. It was too dark to see any features, but when our eyes connected, the thing bolted into the woods. It just didn't look human, frankly. And at this point, I thought it might be a bear or something, as it was standing on its two back legs. And I mean, that son of a gun was quick for its size. I have no idea what I saw, but the profile seems to look like a skinwalker or a wendigo. I have no idea. Any possible help or info to explain what I saw would greatly be appreciated. This story is from my mother, her friend, and her friend's daughter. They also experienced this. I was asleep at the time. My family has a caravan, or trailer, for those in the USA, that we go and stay in for the holidays. It's up in the Victorian high country, here in Australia. It's pretty remote, with some small towns and farms. One night, at 3 a.m., my mother had gone out to the communal bathroom block. Her friend and friend's daughter were also awake. While mother was in the bathrooms, she heard what she described to me as the most horrible, inhuman growl, scream, echoing all throughout the valley. It was nothing that she had ever heard before. Not any of the common animal sounds she had heard there either, like deer calls, possums, bulls from nearby farms. She said that she was terrified. My mother's friend and her daughter had heard it too. They thought my mother was going to be murdered or something. Even our dog was barking. Mother came back safe, and they all spoke about how they had heard it. Somehow I slept through it all. I was only 11 at the time. I've always been curious. I want to know what it sounds like, and what it was, although my mother tells me to this day that I should not want to know. Whenever I'm there, awake at night, it's quiet. I listen. My people are very different from the Navajo and Algonquin. I won't say we are similar, other than the big category we are thrown into. However, there's one thing that crosses from them to me. I'm not sure what exactly it is. I'm not going to ask you, but I'm going to share my experience. I'm a Seminole native from Florida. I was raised among one of the biggest res we have there. It is, however, very overgrown. It gives off a ghost town vibe. I lived by a bunch of people, so I wasn't very afraid of what goes bump in the night. I was probably around 15 when this happened. At this age, I was isolative and only came out of my room when I called. That was it. Maybe I'd get food every now and then, but it wasn't often. So... I was sitting in my room, watching TV, and I heard my mom say, Take Ooch. That's my nickname. It means little girl. So I got up, and I walked out. Asked what she needed. She got confused, and irritated. Told me she did not call me. Made me go back into my room. This happened a bunch, ranging from my real name to my nickname. 
there was this time that I had sat with my mom and remember her telling me to grab a Diet Coke. I thought it was weird because I had just gotten her one a minute ago, but I got up and got it regardless, handed it to her. She was confused. I also was confused and we started arguing. She took it, but I began to question my mental health. That was until she heard it too. I remember, we were sleeping on the floor together and having a rare family night. My sister and I already fell asleep, but my mom was up. I don't know what happened. I woke up to her screaming for something to leave. Go, get out of here, leave us alone. I asked what had happened, but since she was already made, she told me to go back to sleep. I later found out that she had heard footsteps in the hallway, which scares the everlasting life out of me. I know this could be grouped with some other thing, like skinwalkers or wendigos, but according to lore, wendigos will call to you in the voice of people you love, and I believe someone was testing the waters. I used to work on Vandenberg in Central California. My office was on top of the mountain that was ceremonial Chumash land. Whenever ground was broken, we had to have a religious leader come out and bless the ground first. It's usually pretty foggy, about halfway up the mountain. I got used to driving it every day, but you have to keep an eye out for deer, mountain lions, bears, all sorts of wildlife. One night, around 11 p.m., I was driving down the mountain, had just gotten to the point that the fog was gone. In front of me, in the clear, behind was just a wall of fog. As I got to a sharp turn, I saw what I thought was a large coyote in the road. I quickly slammed on my brakes. It looked like it had no fur and was covered in pale, leathery skin with a dog-like head. As I looked at it, it rose up on its hind legs. It was hunched over, maybe six feet tall, but maybe seven feet tall, standing straight up. It turned and looked at me, slowly walked off the road, into the brush. At the time, I was doing a class about Native Americans for my degree. I was in touch with Chumash members for my project, so I asked them if they knew anything about it. They simply said, we don't talk about that. This day, I'm 100% certain I saw a skinwalker that night. I've been told that my situation might be a skinwalker. I don't know if that is true, so I'm here where others know more than I do. I don't know if this has any bearing on anything but my ancestry is Native American and Irish, with a touch of Scottish. My father was Native, his father, Cherokee, and mother, Mattapony. My mother was a Lynch from the Lynch clan, with a Scottish ancestor back in there too. I will try and make this short, and can fill in anything if somebody wants more information. This pretty much started in the 2000s, with some weird events. We had all kinds of, I guess, paranormal things happen. Typical experiences like objects moving, etc. It was me and my three children. Then, I picked up a stalker who would come to the house dressed in all black. He would be wearing a black motorcycle helmet, would be looking in windows day or night. Sometimes, he drove a black vehicle, still wore his helmet, no plates on either. My neighbor chased him off a few times, and if I saw him by the time I could get outside, he would usually be driving away. I came home a few times to weird things like every bowl or spoon in the house missing, all appliances on and plugged in, but all doors and windows closed and locked. Police did not believe me. At the same time, we were experiencing a lot of paranormal activity disembodied voices, seeing people walk across the room, doors opening and closing, cabinets, shower curtain being jerked open 
when the shower and nothing there. We did not tell the police about those events. Then, one night, my girls, about 10 and 12 at the time, woke me up screaming that there was a man at the window. I went to the room. The blind was down, and I thought they had a nightmare because of what was going on. I pulled the blind up, and there was a man standing there. I did not get a good look, but he had to be very tall to look in the window, so I dropped the blind and called the police. We went downstairs to the family room and waited. There was a door in the converted basement, and the knob kept jiggling, like somebody trying to get in. We sat in horror for three hours before the police finally showed up. Outside, the girl's window, they found a blue piece of construction paper with a circle and three smaller ovals created out of a cornmeal-like paste. They figured it meant that me and three children. They did not believe me about any of it because it just snowed and there were no footprints. Not long after this, I became ill and was later on diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, fibromyalgia, and myofascial pain syndrome. The harassment continued as well, and all the paranormal activity. I don't know what else to call it. Fast forward a few years, my children grew up and moved away, and I remarried, and moved about five minutes away. In the beginning, not much happened. I actually felt great, physically and mentally. And then it all started again. We saw people sneaking around, windows and doors, weird things occurring on the inside of the house, paranormal type things. We have seen orbs come in one bedroom while we lay there awake, pause, and go out the other window. And during all of this, my health went downhill again. This is over the last eight years. What is the weirdest is a few times a year we hear a howl, almost like a wolf right outside. I lived in the Montana wilderness for a short while when I was in my early 20s. I have had plenty of wolf encounters. It sounds similar to a wolf, but it is louder, longer, not as guttural, I think. It is always right in the middle of the night, no specific time. It has happened at 8 p.m., as well, and woke us up. Definitely not a dog. Our dogs and cats freak out as well as the neighborhood dogs when it happens too. Then, the smell the next day is like a skunk outside but earthier, not as rancid if that makes sense, but it is not a pleasant smell at all. So, I just wanted to stop and have a nice comfortable normal life as much as that possible. Someone said this might be a skinwalker. I personally have not done anything that I know of, but maybe my parents did. I say this because my mother once told me a story after I was born. They moved down to Mississippi, where my dad was from, a very small town. The house they were to rent was not ready, so they were allowed to stay in the schoolhouse. This was a very rural area. My uncle, dad's brother, was with them, and he was going to stay with them. I don't know if it was the first night or what, but one night, they awoke to the chanting of bring us the baby. They looked out, saw white figures moving in and out of view, all chanting they wanted the baby. My uncle thought it was the KKK because they were native and went out and told them to leave and shot at them. He kept shooting but hit nothing and told my mother they had no legs that he could see. He went back in, and they barricaded the door. This was long before cell phones, so they couldn't call anybody, and there was no phone in the school. They sat there, backs against over desks as it went on until daybreak. My uncle left then, and did not hear from him for three years. My dad would tell me he's not going to talk about it, and if you asked my uncle, he would leave. My mother only spoke of it one time, and refused after that. I'm not saying I'm special in any way, shape, or form, but could all this be connected? Can a deal be made and then I and my children go through this because it was not completed? I'm tired. I am to the point to where I look at my husband and say, oh look, 
the comb is moving across the sink by itself again. Just stupid things. I'm working from home now, and it is non-stop wearing on me. We just heard the howl recently, and had the smell after that. We lost our refrigerator, garage door opener, dryer, and my laptop. To give a better idea of how things are, back in the beginning of November, I was reading on my Kindle on the couch. My husband was at his desk behind the couch area. My desk was in front of me to the left of the fireplace. It was about 8.30 at night. A white weasel ran up the left side of my desk, ran across my desk, a big old metal tanker desk, and jumped down the right side by the fireplace and just disappeared. My dog on my lap saw it, and a Siamese and Maine Coon saw it, all went over to investigate. They were all fluffed up, looked really disturbed and checked out the desk area for about an hour. The dog hid initially after checking it out. He's not very brave. I was told the white weasel was a bad sign, but really gave no more thought to it. But a week later, my father passed away. He was in good health, so it was sudden and a shock. We have cameras inside and out, and the great room came froze when this happened. I rarely get things because the cameras want to freeze up and have to be restarted. I do have one night where we caught orbs doing weird things in the same room, recorded on a motion-activated camera. Anyway, I'm sorry for this being so long. I don't know if any of this is related. All I can say at this point is I'm beyond frustrated. This was a few years ago, and I have not done much research on it, until very recently. My family and I had gone up to my grandparents' house. They had ten acres of land, and only used about an acre and a half for the house and yard. They had a large, dense pine forest all around their house, except for the road to it there was forest for miles all around. They had cut down some trees to make four-wheeler paths that we could ride on when we would go up there. One day, my sister and I were riding out on the paths on some of my grandparents' four-wheelers. For whatever reason, I think it was to get a drink, but I don't entirely remember. My sister went inside. I thought nothing of it. Kept riding the four-wheeler I was on. Well, three minutes later... I was driving past a really dense patch of forest. Over the four-wheeler engine, I heard a loud growl. I heard it clearly to my left in the patch of woods. Thinking it was just a coyote, I looked over towards where I heard the growl. I did not see any coyote. You know that feeling when you look into a forest at night, and you get scared that something will stare back at you? Well, this happened to me but in the very middle of the day. What I was looking at still haunts me to this day. I was staring into two large yellow eyes. It appeared that they were sunken into the creature's face. The eyes were probably about two times the size of a normal human eye, and they were watching me. I could see by looking at the eyes alone that this was an intelligent, smart creature. I didn't get to see what it was, because it was standing in a bush. This bush was also very large, like probably about 10 feet tall. About 8 feet up this bush is where I saw these eyes. I couldn't see any part of this creature, but I did not stick around to find out what it was. I put the four-wheeler into drive, sped up to about 60 miles an hour. I ran inside and did not go back out on the path for the rest of the trip. Nobody else in my family saw anything, but I was terrified of whatever it was. Fast forward six years, and it is this year. I was talking with my friend about spooky things that we had seen. I told him about this story, and began to wonder what I could have possibly seen. I did a lot of research on what large predatory animals live up there in Idaho, it is northern Idaho, if you don't believe me and want to go check. After doing a little bit of digging, 
I found that, well, no animals were eight feet tall. I didn't believe it. I was skeptical of anything that was paranormal. I checked again and again because I didn't want to believe it, that there was something that nobody had ever captured or been able to prove existed. The largest wolf ever found would have only been six feet when standing on its hind legs. The largest bear might have been big enough, but it could not have fit into that bush. So, I began to research any possible creature that it could have been. Eventually, I did find one. A wendigo. It's the only possible creature it could have been. I don't know why it did not attack me, or why it let me get away. Based off the features I saw, the large, yellow, sunken in eyes, it could have only been a wendigo. What scared me even more is that a couple of years later, my grandparents moved out of that house for an unknown reason. They say it was to be closer to the family, but the family was fine making a long drive and coming up very often. They moved only a little bit closer. It's still a long drive. What do you do if a skinwalker has seen you? I was traveling in the dark at work tonight and I'm on a military base in a gated area where it's pitch black, except a single light post near the gate. I need to go outside to smoke. A wolf-like creature that was pitch black walked directly under the light so I could see it fully. I thought cool, looks like a fox because of its thick black tail. Then I realized it was around the size of a wolf with really thin legs a lot of hair hanging down its neck, and its tail was dragging about a foot behind it. It stopped and turned its head slowly towards me. All I saw was its shiny white eyes staring through me. I couldn't move until it looked away, and did a 180, went back into the shadows to where I could not see it. I slowly approached to go out of the gate. It had disappeared after I got outside. The gate locked. I lit my cigarette started smoking, decided to turn on my phone's flashlight, scanned the fence line where it had gone. The area it disappeared into was a lot shorter than I originally thought. The gate I went out only had about 20 feet before another gate cut the area off. The creature had disappeared, so while I was scanning slowly, I saw nothing, but I did hear a whistle that sounded like it had come from not far up directly in front of me through the gate. I slowly backed up, got into my car. Was it a skinwalker? What does the whistling mean? Last I checked, there's no dog I know that's full black with long dragging tails that whistle in the middle of the flight line on a military base. If anybody knows anything, please let me know. I'm scared writing this. We were checking on an escaped rooster in the woods that has backed our house. We took a very shanty flashlight, spotted him quite easily. Something about these woods just aren't right. They feel off, and I had a terrifying encounter with something in them that to this day is both unexplained and witnessed by the police. My neighbor and my girlfriend. But that's a story for another day. Anyway, we were walking back after successfully locating our escaped rooster, perched in the distance on a tree branch just beyond the wood line. This is when we both noticed a gray mist like thing in the sky, almost like an owl. The problem is we both witnessed it vanish into thin air. We went inside for a moment to check on our daughter, and when we went back out to figure out what that was, we found nothing, or so we thought. The house next door built a shed with a motion detection light in their front lawn. We were standing in our front lawn, looking into the trees with a better flashlight, expecting to see an owl. Instead of the motion light kicks on, 
and we see a dog. Sorta. It was something on four legs, and it ran into the distance, only looking back a few times. Problem with this is the dog would have had to have been standing still for at least 10 minutes to not re-trigger the motion light, as it stays on after being activated for 10 minutes. It's like the dog appeared out of thin air in front of the motion light. The strangest part, that it appeared right where we say the misty air creature disappears. What are your thoughts? I'm terrified. Could this be a skinwalker? A shapeshifter? Or something else completely unnatural? This happened to me in the mid-1990s. I was stationed at Camp Pendleton, California, and had duty one evening. Part of the duty shift is to go around and check that certain doors and buildings were securely locked. At about three in the morning, I was out doing my rounds, and I saw what I thought was a big coyote in the road. Seeing a coyote in that area would be unusual, but not impossible. As I was watching it, and it watching me, it stood up on hind legs, walked out of sight between a couple of buildings. At this point, I was alarmed, but I figured I was hallucinating since I'd been awake for something like 24 hours. Wouldn't be the first time my tired eyes and brain had played tricks on me. Later on that morning, one of my fellow Marines, I'll call him H, asked me how my duty was. One thing to understand is that the Marines seem to have a relatively large number of Native Americans. It may have something to do with the pride of code talkers from World War II. And I've had one friend, H, say he joined the Marines because he could not find a warrior job anywhere else. We were infantrymen. At any rate, H was Navajo. I had known him for years even spent a couple of weekends at his family's place near Gallup. I told him about my hallucination. He got quiet and said, that's, I'll call him B, another Marine in my company, also Navajo, but I did not know him nearly as well as I knew H. He's a bad guy. I'd stay away from him. Now, it's always been difficult to tell if H was joking, he was a man of very few words and fewer jokes, but he seemed very serious. I told him to quit messing with me. He responded by telling me that B was a skinwalker. I had never heard that term. That came from a family of skinwalkers, and that they were like bad witch doctors. At that point, I didn't know what to believe, so I dropped it. I can say that every time I came across B after that point, he just stared at me. I gave him a wide berth from then on. He had some other odd experiences in the American Southwest Desert, as well as what was probably a djinn, and when I was embedded with Iraqi troops years later, we could see a man walking around in the darkness, but nothing with thermal or IR sights. But that was by far the strangest and the only time I ever came in contact with anything remotely Skinwalker related. My encounters with this Wendigo creature lasted all throughout high school, and it all started when I was just a freshman in high school. It was near the end of the year, around April or May, and I had gone to a friend's house party. For whatever reason, my close friend at the time decided to have a seance because he believed his house was haunted by his great aunt who had just passed a year prior. I guess he had been having some paranormal things go on in his house and wanted to contact her and speak to her himself. I joined in on the seance and nothing really exciting happened, at least that I can recall. But after that, it changed everything for me. I live about 20 minutes away and so, while I can't say distance was a deciding factor in my experiences, I can probably say, whatever we experienced at that seance, even though I never felt or heard anything, 
must have followed me back home because it was the summer between freshman year of high school and sophomore year that things really kicked off into high gear. It primarily started off with horrendous nightmares, always being chased by this tall black figure with a skeletal-like face and large antlers and horns. It was terrifying, and it was this reoccurring nightmare, the same thing, almost several nights a week, all throughout the summer. I would be walking in the woods on this trail, and this thing would come out of the woods and start barreling towards me, running on all fours, and then, as it would get closer, it would stand up on two legs and reach out to grab me. And every time, I would severely lose speed, turn around, and just as this thing would be about to be grabbing me, I would wake up. This happened constantly, the same nightmare over and over. Once fall kicked in, about September, because I had just begun my sophomore year, I started having sightings of this thing. At first, it would just start off as a typical paranormal thing. You know, seeing shapes and movement out of the corner of your eye in your house. But one night, it was before Halloween, I was staying up late, studying for a math exam, and I saw something outside my window in our yard, moving closer to the house. When I looked out, I thought it was a burglar, or somebody trying to break into our house. But as I sat there and watched, I noticed this figure did not look human as I once thought it was. And on its head, to my horror, were the same horns and antler shapes, just like it appeared in my dream. The figure was jet black, very lanky, kind of like they talk about with Slenderman. But this wasn't a Slenderman. I'm just using that as a reference to explain how long its limbs were, the legs and forearms especially, and its body was kind of slim and gaunt. It moved with much guile, and like it was some sort of secret agent trying not to be caught. I was terrified, but my parents weren't home this night. I can't remember where they were out at. So I rushed into the kitchen, grabbed the largest knife I could find, and hid back in my bedroom, making sure all the house doors were locked and nothing could get in. I looked back out my window, and I could not see it anywhere, but I could just feel this awful presence looming all around the outside of the house. It did not feel welcoming at all. I pretty much stayed up the rest of the night, and yeah, I couldn't really focus on my math exam that I was supposed to be studying for. Instead, I felt like it was far more important trying to stay alive. I fell asleep sometime in the early morning. I woke up. Everything seemed fine. Fast forward to around Christmas time, maybe a week before, and I remember coming downstairs and seeing my dad panicked on the phone, continuously looking out the back window. When he began talking, I realized he was on the phone with 911 and was telling the operator about how he thinks he saw somebody coming up to the house ready to break in. When he got off the phone, I began asking him what's going on, and he points out back to where we have a large bush, thinking he saw somebody coming up to the house, someone who was very large and in all black. Immediately, panic set in, and the memories of summer and what I saw back in the fall came rushing in. But I never told my father this. Within five minutes, an officer showed up, my father spoke with him, and he began thoroughly investigating all around our house, both sides and behind. Of course, like in every story, including ours, he never found a thing and told us to always call again in case something happens. Well, the night went on as usual. Christmas came and went. The first of the year came and went. Now come January, and things really kick up. One night, I was sound asleep when I woke up in the middle of the night to go use the bathroom and get some water. I did that, and as I'm coming back to my room, I quickly laid back down in bed and got ready to fall back asleep. Right as I was in that in-between stage of sleep and awake, I heard something kind of tapping very lightly on my window. It kept doing it three, four, maybe five or six times enough to keep me from falling asleep. 
thinking it was maybe a tree or a branch hitting my window or my side wall. I got up and opened up my blinds, and I screamed and fell back. It was this long, black, clawed hand pressing against the glass of my window, very lightly tapping with the claws. I flew out of bed, ran to my parents' room, and was so overcome with fear that I didn't even care. I looked like a scared toddler running to mommy and daddy's room. I burst through my parents' door, screaming, telling them there's something outside my window, and it's trying to get in. Both my parents rush up, go out, look, and they don't see anything. My father calls the police, again. They come by, they take my statement, they take my parents' statement, they do a thorough search, they don't find anything, except one thing. They find these large tracks, leading from the back of the yard, all the way up to my window, and it was snowing, so they were starting to get filled in. The police officer said whoever it was, was suspected to be a very large man, in a way, though, it did feel validating, knowing I wasn't entirely crazy, but also terrifying, knowing that what I was experiencing was more than real. Valentine's Day came and went, and we get to about the very beginning of March, and I start to see more of this thing. I was walking back home from a friend's house later at night, probably not too late, maybe 7.30, 8pm. It had just gotten dark, and daylight savings time had just happened. I was walking home on a lone neighborhood road. It wasn't deserted or anything. Everybody was just inside, very low to minimal traffic. When I got this feeling of being followed, my first fear and thought was actually being mugged. But as I turned to look, it was this shape following me, hiding behind trees and coming after me through the bushes and anything that I could hide behind, but it was gaining speed, and there were points where I could clearly see the shape and distinctive head of what had been reoccurring through my nightmares. The same thing I had seen, the same hand I had seen on my glass, and it was getting closer. I began sprinting for my life. At one point or another, I had thought about deviating it away from my home, but then I realized it clearly knows where I live and it would be best and much safer to actually make it home, alive, in one piece. I made it home, and I told my father what had happened. He knew there wasn't much the police were going to do. He just forbid me from going out after dark anymore. This entire time, I had been still having these reoccurring nightmares. Not as bad or as often as the summertime, but still very often and frequent even more horrifying than the ones in the summertime. I mean, the feelings and emotions were more intense. That walk home was probably the last time I would actually physically see it until my senior year. Until then, all throughout the rest of my sophomore and even into my junior year and throughout the rest of my junior year, I would just see it out of the corner of my eye, see it approaching my house at nighttime, the same old terror as before even having the constant nightmares. Everything was the same. And then, when I began my senior year, everything intensified. The dreams, the coming up to the house at night, tapping on my window. Everything crescendoed up to one night when I was a senior in high school, near graduation, actually. I was lying in bed, and something woke me up out of a sleep. It wasn't the tapping sound, or the scratching, or the horrible feelings of this thing being around the house. I woke up to the sensation that something was in the room with me, and I could feel an evil presence. I immediately opened my eyes, and I just instinctively knew that this thing had somehow found a way in the house and was now in the room with me. As my brain was finishing and processing this very thought, this heavy raspy breathing began to kick in, and I could hear the weight beneath it on my floorboards creak as it slowly approached my bed. I was frozen in pure fear. I could not move. I lay there, almost sobbing, and it almost nearly got to my bed. And then nothing. It just completely vanished, along with the feelings, everything. It's like the room in the air instantly went still. 
I sat there for a couple more moments, terrified and completely confused. So I turned around quickly, flicked the light on. Nothing was there. The room and everything else felt completely fine. So I sat up, wondered what had just happened. Well, I tried to get some sleep, even though that was easier said than done. So the night goes on, and the very next morning, I got some very disturbing news. Remember that friend I told you about? The one whose great aunt had passed, and him and I did the seance that started this whole thing. Well, him and a couple other friends of mine at his house. He had committed suicide last night, right in the early morning hours. I was shocked and deeply saddened, but since sophomore year, him and I's friendship had pretty much completely dissipated. He went on one path, I went on the other, and he was a very troubled young man. Lots of addiction issues, we'll say, and just a lot of home issues. So now, as I'm older, I don't know if his sudden suicide and this thing stalking me, haunting my life, have any direct connection with each other. Because as soon as that happened, as soon as he committed suicide, that was the last I ever saw or felt of this thing. It's like it just suddenly vanished out of my life. I never felt the horrible feelings of it being outside my window, or heard the tapping, or saw it. It was nothing but peace. I don't really understand the reasoning for that. So the only thing I can possibly theorize is that this thing was somehow attached to him while he was alive, and for whatever reason, attached itself to me. But what I don't understand is why it suddenly vanished once he passed, assuming there is a connection between the two. But I don't know how else to explain my weird series of events. Anyhow, that's my own personal horror story, and my run-in with what I personally believe was a Wendigo demon spirit, or whatever you want to call it. I haven't seen or encountered anything paranormal, weird, uncomfortable, or strange since then, which I'm very thankful to report. Feel free to use this story in any way. Hopefully, you sharing this story will help somebody else out there.